I'm a scientist. I do astrophysics. I study the laws of nature, how gravity creates stars and planets from interstellar gas and dust. I study the evolution of the universe, but that's not what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk about how curiosity and science has driven a series of technological revolutions that has profoundly altered the way we live on this planet. Let me use a few examples from astronomy and physics. Our ancestors were familiar with the sky. They knew the changes of the stars with the seasons. The five planets you could see with the naked eye, how they moved, how the moon and sun changed their positions in the sky. When the sun moved north, if you were living in the northern hemisphere, it was time to plant. When the sun moved south in its annual motion, it was time to harvest. This was practical because it aided farming. It, in fact, was essential for survival. But the nature of the objects in the sky remained unknown until relatively recently. Bit by bit, science and curiosity led us to understand the forces of nature, her laws, her principles. Exploitation of these principles led to a series of technological revolutions. Ever since Roman times, most people thought that the Earth was a center of the universe. But then in the 1500s, Nikolai Copernicus had a better idea. He thought that the sun was at the center of our solar system. And the Earth revolved around that sun just like the other planets. A wealthy nobleman from Denmark, Tycho Brahe, built an observatory because he thought that Copernicus's ideas were heretical. He wanted to disprove them. He built an observatory to make precision measurements, as precise as could be in those days, with the naked eye of the motions of the planets, the moon, and the sun. A young protege, Johannes Kepler, took this data, derived the laws of planetary motion, laws we still use today. These laws allowed you to predict the future positions of the planets with enough precision to predict eclipses. A few years later, Galileo Galilei used a brand new invention, the telescope, to first look at the objects in the sky. In, six, in 1610, he discovered craters on the moon, phases of the planet Venus facing the sun, dark spots on the sun, and most remarkably, four moons orbiting the planet Jupiter like a miniature solar system, showing to him that Copernicus was probably right in his model. This made Galileo curious about the laws of motion here on Earth. He devised a series of experiments and discovered the laws of mechanics. A few decades later, Isaac Newton found the mathematics underlying the laws of mechanics. This started a scientific revolution that continues through today. Newton's work was published in the Principia Mathematica. This became one of the most influential books in the late 17th century. Newton's physics Newton's view of the world revolutionized how we viewed our universe. Forces acted on objects to produce motion. Machines replaced the power of muscle. First, windmills, then water wheels, then levers and gears. Eventually, we harnessed the heat of gases, of hot gases. We invented the steam engine. The Industrial Revolution was a result one to two centuries later. Let me move forward to the beginning of the 19th century. Since antiquity, we knew about some processes like static electricity, lightning, certain minerals having magnetic properties. But these phenomena were not explored in any detail until the beginning of the 19th century. Michael Faraday performed a series of experiments. He found that moving static electric charges produced electric currents. Electric currents produced magnetic fields. And if you moved a magnetic material, magnet changing magnetic fields produced electric currents. A few decades later, the mathematician James Clerk Maxwell unified the laws of electricity and magnetism and derived four equations in 1864. A remarkable consequence of these equations was that it predicted the existence of an electromagnetic wave moving at the speed of light. Maxwell realized that light is a specific wavelength of electromagnetic waves. This understanding led to a revolution, the invention of generators, of electric motors, 
the electrification of our planet. A few decades later, it led to communications near the speed of light, first through wires, but then through air and through space at the speed of light, the invention of radio. A century later, television. This is what I call the electromagnetic revolution. It led to a host of electronic devices we use today. The beginning of the 20th century, attention turned from the giant orbits of planets to the microscopic world of atoms and molecules. By that time, we realized that atoms consist of very small particles called electrons orbiting a heavier nucleus made of protons and neutrons. Scientists like Max Planck, Niels Bohr, Albert Einstein were interested in how light and electromagnetic waves interacted with atoms. They discovered that instead of just being particles, electrons and, in fact, neutrons and protons were also waves. In 1905, Albert Einstein realized that light, which Maxwell had claimed as a wave, also acts like a particle. It depends on how you look at it. You know, you've all seen that cartoon of atoms where the electrons orbit the nucleus like a miniature solar system. That picture is wrong. If that picture were correct, Maxwell's equations predicted that atoms would collapse. The electrons would spiral into the nucleus within one microsecond, and you and I would not be here to talk about it because electrons are waves, atoms are stable. This understanding underlies our modern understanding of matter. With radio, we needed some way of amplifying electrical signals. We invented the transistor in the mid-1948 time frame. That led to uh, microcircuits, eventually computers. Your cell phone today is the outgrowth of the quantum mechanics revolution of the early 20th century. Our devices, the internet, could not exist without this understanding that matter consists of waves on the microscopic scales. So where's our current understanding of the universe taking us? What are the future technologies? Let's turn again to astronomy. We live in the golden age of this subject because you and I are part of the first generation to see the universe in all wavelengths of the spectrum. Up until the 1930s, Everything we knew about the cosmos came to us from a narrow sliver of that spectrum, visual light. Before 1880, literally by looking at the sky, either with your naked eye or to a telescope. Then we invented photography, so we'd record our images. But with the invention of radio in the 1930s, we discovered cosmic radio waves. This is the first new window on the cosmos. In the 1960s, we gained access to space with rockets. We could, for the first time, fly above the atmosphere, which absorbs almost all the wavelengths of electromagnetic light that we can see. In the latter part of the 20th century, we launched dozens of satellites with telescopes that could see this universe throughout all the entire spectrum, from gamma rays to X-rays to ultraviolet to the infrared. And I'll show you behind me a picture of the sky, the winter sky with Orion just below the middle, the Pleiades cluster in the upper right, at visual wavelengths with a long time exposure. I will then retune your eyes and your brains to a wavelength 200 times visual light to show you what the infrared sky looks like. Curves here are satellites. The stars have disappeared to be replaced by interstellar clouds of gas and dust. If I zoom in to a certain patch of sky, in this case the Eagle Nebula, here shown with a Hubble Space Telescope view at visual wavelengths, if I then retune your eyes to a wavelength four times longer, in the near infrared, those pillars of dust become translucent, and a myriad of stars appears in the background, which were hidden by that cosmic dust. We opened up an entirely new type of window on the cosmos. Waves of gravity were discovered from merging black holes and neutron stars. Exactly 100 years after Einstein predicted the existence of those waves, our generation of scientists are doing for the cosmos what the great voyages of discovery did for geography 500 years ago. Magellan and other voyagers discovered new continents, new oceans, new cultures. Our generation is discovering the universe. We are the first to see the universe in all its wavelengths. And man is a changing our view of the world. Before the 1920s, most scientists would have said the universe is more or less static. But then Edwin Hubble 
and Vesto Slipher, Georges Lemaitre, discovered that the galaxies, those great systems of stars like our Milky Way, are moving away from each other. The universe is expanding. In the 1960s, Vera Rubin studied galaxies. She realized that there's five times more stuff in these galaxies than can be accounted for by ordinary matter made of atoms and molecules. This stuff does not interact with light or any form of electromagnetic radiation. Because of that, we call it dark matter. But it influences the gravitational field. It influences the way stars move, and it bends light. In this picture, you see two clusters of galaxies in white. In purple, you see the distribution of dark matter, which makes up five times as much stuff as the mass in the ordinary matter in these galaxies. Dark matter, we don't know what it is. We are developing new technologies to explore it. In the latter half of the 20th century, astronomers expected that the universe would slow down its expansion. Why? Because gravity attracts. All the mass in the cosmos should slow down that expansion. We are looking for that slowing down. By the 1990s, we were in for a root surprise. The universe's expansion was not slowing down. It was accelerating. The galaxies are moving away ever faster. How do we know? Because telescopes are like time machines. You see, because of the finite speed of light, when you look into space, you see further back in time. When you see the sun, you don't see it the way it is now. You see it the way it was eight minutes ago. If you're in the southern sky and you look at the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, you see it the way it was four years ago. And in the spring, you look to the east, you see the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest system of stars like our Milky Way that's as large as the Milky Way. You're seeing light with your eyes that left two million years ago. The further you look into space, the further back in time we can see. We can see the 14 billion year evolution of the cosmos. And what we've learned is that in recent five billion years, the acceleration of the universe has been increasing. It's a empty space was pushing the galaxies apart. So what does this imply for our future? Why can we, can we afford to do this research into exotic materials like dark matter, dark energy? We cannot afford not to do it. We live in the middle of a pandemic. Yet in one year, we develop vaccines to combat this scourge of COVID-19. This is only made possible because for over a century, thousands of researchers have invested their careers in researching biology, in understanding the molecular basis of life, the genetic code of DNA and RNA, how viruses interact with humans. That's why we could develop this vaccine so quickly. It would not have been possible without a century-long investment in science. We face climate change. We can understand it in part because we can model the Earth's atmosphere. We can also study other planets and how their climates behave. We actually can know how the emission of gases by human activity is altering our climate. We know what we have to do. The question is, do we have the will? What will the current set of cosmic mysteries lead to? Honestly, I do not know. But what I do know is that the last 500 years of human experience has told us is that the exploration of these cosmic mysteries has been the foundation of our technology, our economy, and our very way of life on this planet. 